right in. The thing that I want to um, give you a little bit of background on first on not how I know what I know, but how I know what I know. And that is basically, um, so I was a local election official in Arizona, in Maricopa County for more than a decade. And I have served as the liaison for the election center, which is the national association of local and state election officials to the postal service for more than a decade now. And I serve on the mailers technical advisory committee. Um, and that is um, a, a group of about a hundred individuals representing associations all across the country that rely on the postal service. Um, and so over the course of my almost 20 years now in election administration and working with election officials, um, a lot of it has focused on how do we ensure access and security um, to our various streams and, and abilities to vote. And so what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about, let me see if I can minimize this completely. There we go. Um, I learned that lesson in the last one. I left the whole screen open. So um, I can learn still. Um, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of the national landscape of voting by mail, um, as well as the applications in order to get a ballot, the delivery and return of the ballot, reporting of some of the results, and then there's a slew of resources, everything from um, academic studies on the partisan impact of voting by mail, as well as, um, as tools that you can use to compare one state's rejection rates to another state um, in the resource section. So there's a lot of information here, and you'll notice that three of the things here are um, asterisked. Um, and I do that because, let's see if it'll, advance for me here. Um, in all of those three sections, we're going to think about those various topics or the process of voting by mail and applying to get a ballot in this moment. In how do we think about that safely, voting in a pandemic? How do we think about the security of this voting channel? And then particularly this year, the politics behind, uh, behind vote by mail. So we knew at the beginning of this year um, that there were gonna be some real challenges as soon as we, um, we realized the global pandemic um, reach. And so states started reacting to that. And um, this is from the National Conference of State Legislators or NCSL. Um, and also I'm gonna throw a ton of information at you. It's kind of like a fire hose with me sometimes. Um, and so um, all of these things will be available after the fact as John mentioned, as well as links to the source data. So many states decided they were for the first time ever going to send out a ballot application to all of their actively registered voters. And I say it that way very purposefully because it, it is not the case that ballot applications were being mailed out to every person. It was only to registered voters um, who were eligible for the election. So how did that go? Well, Iowa Secretary of State recently tweet, tweeted this out. Um, the total number of voters in their primary election was more than half a million, 531,000. And that surpassed their previous high of by almost 100,000 voters um, of 449 um, uh, was the turnout in 1994. So we know that it was effective to send out ballot applications to voters in this global pandemic. Other states chose to mail the ballot out to voters. Um, and we see here the two green states of Nevada and my state where I live currently is, is Maryland. Um, and they sent it out in the primary. Um, so how did that go? Um, recently at the National Association of State Elections Directors, um, the state elections director from Nevada um, shared that it was the most ballots ever cast for a primary election um, in his state. So both channels and both, um, both ways of engaging voters in this moment seem to be effective in the states that utilized them. What I want to do is take a step back and look at something that I often refer to as the snow globe of elections. Um, Charles Stewart at MIT started this um, a few years ago and I think that is an interesting way of looking back at voting behavior in this country. So at the top of the triangle are voters that have chosen to vote at the polls on election day. On the lower left hand side are voters who voted by mail and on the right hand side are voters who have voted early. So we see starting in 1996 the voters traditionally were voting on election day but as time passes and voters are given options they tend to fall away from voting only on Tuesday. So this is the last presidential election and you can see that the states are really all over the triangle map on where 
where their voters are choosing to vote. It changed a little bit in 2018 because we know we had a lot of first time voters. So they tended to migrate back up to Tuesday election day. And this is important because new voters may not know they have options in voting. New voters this year, all of the people who are registering um, to vote may think they have to go to the polls on Tuesday on election day. And in this moment of a global pandemic, we wanna make sure they understand what their options are. And I often talk about um, voting by mail um, as an evolutionary path. Um, and this is a, a great uh, resource from the Vote at Home, National Vote at Home Institute. And I talk about that path of it starts out, you need an excuse. You need to provide a doctor's note. You need to show an airline ticket to say you're not going to be in town or you can't go to the polls on election day. And that's the first step. What happens then is states get so many excuses and so many reasons and quite frankly, no one looks at those. No one checks to make sure the voter really isn't going to be home. It's just kind of a, an additional bureaucratic um, obstacle for people. So as those obstacles are pulled away, there's no excuse voting where anyone can vote. And what we find there is that traditionally, particularly in the West, you'll notice there's a lot of blue out West, um, is that voters who tend to vote by mail tend to like it and do it for every election. But states require in some cases where you have to apply for each ballot for each election. And then it gets to a point where election officials literally cannot get them processed quickly enough to get the ballots out. This is something we saw in the primary um, season with Wisconsin and, and other states just under the tsunami of applications. That's when states tend to move to a permanent early voting list. And after their permanent early voting list gets to be 60, 70, 80% of their electorate, that's when states tend to go all vote by mail. So the five states that mail out a voters, a ballot to every voter um, are, um, first it was Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Utah, and Hawaii. And you'll see that California is striated here because of the Voters' Choice Act, where the majority of, or some of the states, uh, some of the counties in the state, about almost 50% of the um, counties have adopted that. But we know this year they will be mailed for the November, they'll mail out a ballot to everyone. You'll notice though that states like um, my former state of Arizona, even though their permanent early voting list has anywhere from 60, 70, 80, and in some cases is clo close to 90% in some of the counties of their voters get a ballot by mail, they do not um, mail out a ballot to everyone automatically, which is the most efficient way to go. Secretary of State um, Kim Wyman from Washington likes to kind of uh, tease Arizona and say, you know what, you, you really are a vote by mail state, you just don't admit it. Um, so that's you know something to, to kind of look at. Arizona is the only, is the one state in this country that literally could flip the switch to move to vote by mail, but they have not. But what have the states done? This is, this is Charles Stewart. This is another screenshot I grabbed at the recent um, NASED um, conference. And what we're looking at here are the primaries this spring um, in chronological order, comparing their use of mail ballots from 16 to the 20 primaries. So we start with New Hampshire and South Carolina, Alabama, Arkansas, and we see that that vote by mail use was pretty much the same because back in February and early March, the impact of COVID wasn't nearly what we saw when we get into the, the later part of March. Now, um, you'll notice that um, California is the outlier there, and that's because of the implementation of the Voters' Choice Act. You'll also notice that Michigan in the early part of um, March was a little bit of an outlier as well. That is a part of the impact of COVID, but also because of Prop 3, and um, they recently passed a proposition that allows no excuse absentee, and that's another reason why they had a big jump. But for the remaining states to go from five, six, seven, eight, maybe 10% of your voters voting by mail to 90% of your voters voting by mail is a dramatic shift. Um, and that is where we see you know, some real challenges in election administration of the vote by mail process. I'd like to share this because this is a guideline um, and timeline that was put together. There's about four more pages of it. It's available out on election line. And again, we'll share all the links. Um, of the timeline of things that need to occur in order to conduct an election all by mail. And you'll see that some of the blocks of blue were past that 
it's too late in the game to do some of these things. Um, and you'll also notice that I've highlighted the date that the first ballots will be mailed in every state are for military and overseas voters, September 19th. So when you hear legislators, when you hear governors, when you hear people talking about, we'll take care of this in August, we'll take care of it in October, it's too late to do it then. So I also wanna be very clear, because there seems to be some confusion by some individuals, that absentee voting is voting by mail. The, um, the terminology is interchangeable. Um, let's pick a state like um, Florida. Um, Florida doesn't say absentee voting anywhere in its statutes anymore. It was changed years ago to voting by mail. So even though some states call it absentee voting, some states call it voting by mail, those, uh, those phrases and terminology one of the only times in elections, they actually are interchangeable. Now, I think it's really important also to know that for tens of millions of Americans leading up to this point, they've had their ballots handed to them by a postal carrier, not a poll worker. And voting by mail started in the Civil War. It's been going on for a long time in this country. Um, and in those five states, that's who votes by mail exclusively. Um, they have less than 2% of their voters that go to a polling place. But in this moment, we really can't make any assumption about how voters want to behave in a global pandemic. So now I'm going to share just some really um, quick screenshots of some polling that's been done, starting with uh, the Pew Research Center um, that stated that, you know, 66% of voters said they would feel uncomfortable going to a polling place to vote. We know that this varies across the country on who has strong support of vote at home or vote by mail. We also know that it varies by age and demographic, um, by college um, degree and education levels. This is more from um, Pew Research Center. And we also know that political party um, has a difference of opinion on vote by mail and that this has changed pretty dramatically um, since 2018. It's also important to note that both political parties have always had a very robust vote by mail or absentee campaign, both at the national, state, and local levels, and they will continue to do so um, this year. But the rhetoric that's being espoused and the narrative that's being um, put forth nationally is having an impact on whether or not voters um, feel that it's, it's, it's a, a valid way of voting. And that tends to, from what the research is showing, impact one party over another. Um, we also know that the vast majority of voters really feel that it is um, something that they support. So either strongly supporting it or supporting it only for November, um, it's over uh, 60, um, what, 67%. Um, but again, some of the political um, partisan kind of leanings of who feels that this is an accurate way to do it, if they support it or not support it. Um, and it, a lot of it stems from this, and that's voter fraud. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about voter fraud. I will say right here and now that voter fraud is minimal. You oftentimes will hear, and I've done it myself, when people are talking about voter fraud or too often they lump in election fraud, which are campaigns targeting voters, not voter fraud where I am a voter and I'm trying to fraudulently impact the outcome of the election, but someone else is for forcing this on me or they are um, subverting my ability to vote. I see that as voter fraud. So the challenge here is that um, oftentimes voter fraud is used to um, push for something like ID at the polls. And ID at the polls targets voter fraud of impersonation of a voter. And that is the rarest form of any kind of fraud. And so oftentimes people will say, you know, the, the ID push is looking for a problem to solve that doesn't exist um, when the voter fraud that tends to surface is in vote by mail or absentee voting. And that makes it look like it's rampant or it's somehow a larger problem. But what we're really talking about is you know, infinitesimal amounts in both cases. It's a question of five zeros before the, the, the um, decimal point or four zeros before the decimal point. But that's not the, um, the opinion of the public and that's not the narrative that they're hearing. And that is going to influence the way in which voters 
interact with the voting in uh, November. So I wanted to share this slide because this is, um, I took this from a presentation that I gave for the National Conference of State Legislators to state legislators to say, these are the concerns you as a state policymaker need to be thinking about moving into November. And this was um, done a month or so ago. One is the application process, and we're gonna talk more extensively about that and whether or not it's for each election, if there's an annual or a permanent list. The ballot envelope requirements and design, and I'm gonna show you some terrible designs and explain why that's a problem. Um, talk a little bit about ballot tracking and the security there. Checking the statutory dates and deadlines of when a voter can make a request providing ballot return options, updating postmarking language, and then also the security overall. So let's talk about applications. Um, in this moment, we have a situation where, you know, individuals are quarantined, even in um, the states that have opened up, there is still limited interaction. So voters are not interacting with candidates, campaigns, supervisors, auditors, county recorders, um, third party groups at the county fairs, at the farmer's market, in front of the library to get registered and to fill out absentee requests. So many election officials and advocates are coming up with very creative ways to get the absent request in front of voters when their legislatures and others will not allow them to mail them out. So here's some examples from Ohio. Um, this is another example from um, a presentation at NASAD um, from Amanda Grandjean, who's the state elections director, and she and Frank LaRose, the secretary of state, have done a variety of things to get applications out in front of voters. The challenge when you do this sort of activity is that it's, the voter is then handwriting that information and it's up for interpretation, as opposed to when you mail out an application to a voter, they're pre-populated, they're barcoded, they can be quickly um, clicked with a scanner and the information ingested into the voter registration system. Um, so if you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of applications, Georgia sent out 6.8 million applications. Um, we're talking about really um, efficiencies when you do that. The other thing when you hear voters say, I sent in an application and I never got my ballot. There, in any way of voting in our democracy, there, there are points of failures that we can fall into. And some of the pitfalls are, was it an official application sent out to all registered voters, like I just mentioned, or was it an application by a candidate, a campaign, a political action committee, and what was the return address? Because many states allow for anyone to do a vote by mail campaign, and that application come back to them rather than the elections office. The example that I'm showing here from Louisiana is another pitfall, and that is oftentimes and the, I should state that the picture here is not an application. This is an actual ballot, so it doesn't really align with the headline, which as journalists, I'm sure you can appreciate the problem there. Um, if they had the appropriate photograph, that photograph would show a business reply mail with all the lines going down it. And what happens with um, the Postal Service is that anything that's business reply mail, they take them, they count them up, and they take the postage from an account. In this case, the um, Orleans Registrar, the Orleans Parish in Louisiana, had 4,000 applications come in and no money in her account to pay for them. Um, I've seen this before in the past um, with campaigns and candidates. There was a candidate in Maryland a few years ago that had hundreds of them. Um, they had withdrawn, so they said, I'm not going to pay for that. Um, and so the Postal Service contacted me and we were able to get them to the, the correct election official and the election official's office went ahead and paid the postage on it. So this is another instance where we need to know more of the story in order to get it absolutely right. There's um, up in the upper corner here, I've got a, a graphic for Milwaukee and there was a report that just came out that we'll include in the information about some of the issues that arose in Wisconsin and particularly in Milwaukee. Um, there was a story that came out and in fact, just yesterday, um, it was reiterated in another news article about the undelivered voters ballots that were found in a processing plant in Milwaukee. Well, uh, the real story there is that those application, the applications for those ballots were received by the deadline, which was Friday before Tuesday's election. 
the city of Appleton um, went ahead and got those processed over the weekend, sent them to their third, the file to their third party mailer on Monday, the day before the election. The mailer went ahead and processed and got those ballot packets ready and took them to the post office at 6 p.m. on election day. So that's why those ballots were still sitting in the processing plant. And that's why it's a problem when voters are able to apply for a ballot late in the game. The challenge is, is that a ballot being applied for, it's not just you snap your fingers and it goes out in the mail. It takes a minimum of 24 to 48 hours um, for the local election official to process the application, especially if they have tens of thousands of them or hundreds of thousands. Um, and then you have the, um, the time frame if they're working with a mailing system or a mail house to get them out as well. So we really need to think about these timelines. If you are a, a reporter that covers any of these states, this is going to be an issue in your state. We have states, um, the one day deadline, those states you can apply for a ballot to be mailed to you on Monday for Tuesday's election. And this is just, it's atrocious. It's setting up the voters for failure. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is the case. Um, one of the things we need to think about also is that um, in this moment, we do everything differently. We shop for groceries differently. We socialize or don't socialize with our friends and family differently. And in this moment, we may, may need to vote differently. Um, and we need to flatten the curve by requesting our ballots as early as possible. The reason is, and this photograph you see here, you're going to see a lot of Twitter <laughs> on, my, on my presentation. So my apologies, but um, it's where I live. Uh, this is Johnson County, Iowa, and this is how they fulfill their ballot um, applications. Someone sitting at a desk, folding up ballots, making sure the right ballots going in the right envelope, with the right voting instructions, putting the right label on manually by hand. This takes a while. Um, compared to jurisdictions like this, which is King County, Washington, this is how they fulfill their ballots. Um, these ballot envelopes are all put onto a, a large machine that um, sorts and inserts all of the right information, all of the right ballots, um, and then gets them out to the, to the voter themselves. So let's talk about um, delivery. A few years ago, um, under Postmaster Brennan, former Postmaster Brennan and former Deputy Postmaster um, Ron Stroman. Um, I was fortunate enough to start working with them very, very closely on getting the message through to the Postal Service that this is not just another envelope. This is someone's vote. And it's together that we deliver democracy to tens of millions. And in this moment, we could be upwards of 100 million um, voters in November. Um, and it was really a shift of, of kind of uh, thought in, um, in their role in our elections. Um, and the relationship is really, really critical. And I'm this is a, a little canary in the coal mine for our conversation later on about the new deputy, the new postmaster. Um, so that's Deputy Ron Stroman there that I'm pleading my case to um, quite emphatically. And we were really fortunate. They did a lot of things to help election officials and to shore up the mechanisms and the channels in place to get voters their ballots. The reason that this has been a challenge, and this is a report that I wrote um, at the Bipartisan Policy Center back in 2016, is that I don't know about you, but I'm not writing out a check and mailing it in for um, all of my bills anymore. Um, nobody, or rather very few people do that. So the Postal Service went through and did something they called plant rationalization. So ballots mail no longer just go across town. They're going to a processing plant and then back again. And that processing plant might be in another state. That processing plant might be 100 miles away or 200 miles away. So we created this, what I refer to as the new reality of voting by mail. There's a checklist for voters who vote by mail of the things they should be contemplating, a checklist for election officials on what they need to be thinking about, a checklist for state legislators on the things they need to do in their, in their code, um, and also a checklist for the Postal Service. Now, this is four years old, but I will say that it is still 99.9% .9 valid. The only things that have changed is in on my checklist for the Postal Service, we've actually done some of those things. Um, and many other states have done some of the things that are on their uh, individual checklist, but there is still a lot of work to be done. It all comes back to this, and that is first class mail delivery is two to five days. Most people think it's, you know, you put it in the mail and it gets there the next day or a day after that. Um, and standard mail, which was formerly called marketing mail, is three to 10 day delivery. And I will tell you that many, if not most, if not all of the Western states, 
um, mail out ballots to voters using standard mail. Now that's not a problem if they're mailing them out 45 days before, 30 days before. Um, and we do know that the Postal Service has, up until this moment, been providing emphasis and um, particular um, considerations to try and get ballots moving through, even if it is standard mail. Um, but we know that every election has a story to tell, you say 2000, you think of Florida, um, 2016 or two, 2016, it was you know foreign interference. At this moment, we think it has, it'll be a COVID story that we're telling, but we won't know sometimes until long after the ballots are counted. And I will say that no one wants to be one of your headlines <laughs> because too often the headlines are because of bad things. So I wanted to share with you that anyone that's involved in um, providing voters with the service of participation in the franchise has the opportunity to be part of a bad headline. So this is from uh, last year, October of last year, talks about Atlantic City um, and they had increases in vote by mail and uh, the print vendor made a lot of mistakes. Um, the printing error at the top is when you look at a ballot, oftentimes you see these, these header codes, the barcodes at the top, um, they had errors in the, the header code and that's how a machine reads the ballot. Um, in some cases, they forgot to put the bubble for the voters to fill in, that's a challenge. Um, on a ballot. And then they had insertion errors where they had the wrong ballots going in or they used the wrong, um, the wrong uh, return envelope for the wrong jurisdiction. And this is all to say that elections are not only conducted by people for people, um, but we know that there can be mistakes. And the question is, how do we find them and shore up the system in ways that we know will eliminate and, um, and remediate them as much as possible? This is Dave Williams. He's the current COO um, of the United States Postal Service. He has three things um, in his message to election officials that we need to do in order to make sure that vote by mail runs as effectively as possible. And that is design, using the intelligent mail barcodes in full service, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about, and then informed um, visibility, which is part of the ballot tracking. So this is not a good ballot design. Um, we know that bad ballot design can in fact send the ballot back to the voter when it's supposed to go into the elections office or vice versa. And part of it is because at the processing plants, ballots are running through these machines and the machine is bouncing light off of it and it's using an algorithm to, um, to find the address or an intelligent mail barcode if it's there. If it's not there, it's spraying on a barcode. So the barcode that you're seeing right here was actually applied by the postal service and you'll also notice that, oops, let me go back here, sorry. Um, right here is the zip code embedded in this barcode. Now, if we think about this, this is the barcode or the um, zip code for the destination address. This is the number that should be here. Ah, sorry about that, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because this envelope is so busy, it couldn't decide what was the right information here so it went up to the return address and was able to pull the barcode and this ballot went back to a voter. This is the back of some of the envelopes where they put the voter's address in the very area where you would put an address to, to deliver the ballot to when in fact this is going back to the elections office. So some of these design elements are a real problem and it's part of what we saw again in that Milwaukee review of the village of Fox Point. So we know that there was a tub of ballots that the village of Fox Point took to the post office and they, the post office brought it right back to them the next day. They didn't know why, they took it back to the post office, post office brought it back to them the very next day and no one could tell why. So the investigation found that this was because not so much the envelope but the label. So you can see here, this is actually a label that was, was added to, um, to the envelope and it contains all this information. The voter's address has been um, obscured, but the very first thing that's on here is Village of Fox Point and then their ward. And that was what was being printed out on the label and it was causing the, the ballots to be returned to the, um, to the elections office. And those are where problems need to be solved by using things like envelopes for the Center for Civic Design. And many jurisdictions across the country are using them now. These are some samples from 
Michigan, from California. Um, and you can see how, you can tell this is a ballot. They all look very similar, even though um, the colors are slightly different from one county to the next. And that helps at the post offices processing plants to know that they're going to the right location, the right county. Visibility really matters. Um, you may have noticed um, as we go through these strange green tags, these are um, visibility tags for ballots so that as ballots are brought into a processing plant, it's highly identifiable that they are ballots. You can definitely see on the palette on the left that those are ballots. The palette on the right, not so much. That might sit there um, because it doesn't have the visibility in front of it. Um, Election officials around the country know that if they put out on Twitter a picture with a green tag 191, that it's an automatic retweet for me. Um, so my thread is full of pictures, thankfully, of green tags. Another way that we can increase our visibility um, is within the data at the, po at the Postal Service. And those intelligent mail barcodes that you see on the mail that I've talked about a couple of times, one of the um, wish list items in that new reality of voting by mail report was to create a ballot service type ID for, ba for ballots within the intelligent mail barcode. Um, all of that is to say it's important when the Postal Service running millions of pieces of mail through their processing plants, Denver does more than 10 million mail pieces a day, that they know how many ballots they have, how many were brought in, and how many went out the door, and that those numbers are the same. And this allows them to create lo logistical triggers in their analytics to know that ballots are being moved out sufficiently. It's also important that voters have the ability to track their own ballot like you would a package. Um, so the state of Virginia um, did ballot tracking statewide. Um, and I will tell you, I've had this exact same conversation in my years as an election official where a voter would call in and say, you know, I haven't gotten my ballot. It's been a couple of weeks now. I don't know what to do. And here Dave Bierke from Falls Church, Virginia um, said, you know, well, what would you like me to do? You want me to send you another one? And the voter says, well, you know, it really should be here. Wait a minute. Let me look at the pile of mail on my desk in front of me. And there was the ballot. Now that is not to say that every single voter that says they didn't get their ballot really got their ballot and it's on the dining room table or the kitchen counter, but we do know that that happens and it happens probably more frequently than anyone wants to, um, to know. So how can we get around having that voter have to call in and say, I don't know where my ballot is. There are things that they can do. Um, and that is having the ballot tracking that pushes out that notice to the voter to say, You're, we're showing a text message your ballot was delivered. Um, if the jurisdiction isn't doing individualized tracking, they also, every voter or every person in this country that has mail delivery can sign up for informed delivery. And I have this myself every day, I have a post office box and every day I get an email that shows me what's in my mailbox that day. So here's an example from Orange County Registrar in Orange County, uh, California. And he not only, um, promoted having informed delivery, making sure people signed up for it so they would know when their ballot should be in their mailbox. But he also utilized this augmented service that the Postal Service provides where you can click on it, you get it on your smartphone, you click on it and it tells you, sign up here for ballot tracking. Um, this is where you can drop off your ballot. Here's information on candidates. So there's ways in which we can um, really make that a more robust experience um, for the voters. With any mail piece that goes out, you can do that sort of thing. It's also important to know that the Postal Service recommends that voters mail back their ballots one week before the due date. So if it's due on Tuesday, they should put it in the mail the Tuesday before. And we've already talked about all those states where you can still request a ballot after the deadline. I think it's also important to note that this is pre-COVID um, and we're gonna circle back to that in a minute. Um, it's also important and some of the reminders that are really helpful when covering vote by mail or absentee voting in your state um, is to make sure that voters know if they're dropping it in a blue box, double check and see what the pickup time was. If you put it on uh, in a ballot drop box on Saturday at three and the carrier picked it up last at noon, it's not going to get picked up until Monday and that's going to be you know, a potential problem. So we need to make sure we're paying attention to that. If the states where you cover are a postmark state, it's also important to know that voters can go into any post office counter and ask to have their envelope hand canceled or round stamped. Um, and it's also important to know that um, not there is no guarantee that things will be postmarked. That's it's 
was actually invented and used to cancel a stamp so you couldn't peel it off and put it on another letter and you know, not have to buy postage. Um, so it's not a guarantee. And this is a way to make sure that voters are empowered to know in those states that they can go in and have it be round stamped. And it really does work. So Maryland is a postmark state um, and they advertised it widely that you could do this round stamp. And here's an example um, from Rockville uh, Maine Post Office. So let's talk about what happens when things are really close. It could happen in November in a variety of places, in a variety of races. I mean, so back in 2017, there was a single vote balance and um, there was 55 ballots in one county that, as they say, landed with a thud. Here's the photograph of the, of the pictures, of the, or the photograph of the ballots um, that, that Stafford County tweeted out and they were outraged that these had been delivered late on Wednesday morning. Um, so the state elections director reached out to me and I reached out to the postal service and we were trying to figure out how did these get missed because leading up to election day in that final week, processing plants do hourly sweeps, looking for ballots, looking for that official election material mail logo, looking for things that say their ballots, looking for that design with the bar down the side. Um, so how did these get missed? Unfortunately, that county um, registrar uh, did not um, send the photographs of each individual envelope front and back so we could track them down to the state elections director. So the Postal Service reverse engineered that informed delivery that I was talking about. They were able of the 55 ballots to capture 49 of the images and of the 49 images, 46 of them were mailed on election day and on Monday the day before. We also realized that the logo was not present on these envelopes. This registrar did not use the ballot tracking that was offered. Um, and so this looked like, these looked like any other envelope in the processing plant. No other county in Virginia had this kind of an issue. Um, and just recently, I spoke to the Virginia Election Board and they will be requiring that logo um, for all of their, their counties moving forward. There's some challenges though, as I mentioned that um, when you use the, if you don't use the postmark, there are many rejections of ballots that come in late. Um, and there are some states that use a postmark that sometimes the postmark is illegible or it's missing for a variety of reasons. And so states are looking at additional information and data from the Postal Service that they can use to make sure that the voter mailed it on time. It started with Secretary Houston in Ohio in 2016. Those little orange marks on the back of your mail actually contain the same information as a postmark. Um, other state, and we know that in Ohio that year, Cuyahoga County was able to count 73 additional ballots because they used the orange processing marks. So Secretary Wyman in Washington state saw that. She bought the scanners for all of her county auditors and they use it as well. States like Iowa and Kansas have changed their, their um, statutes to say, not just a postmark, but are otherwise indicated by the United States Postal Service to have been mailed on or before the close of the polls. This kind of technologically agnostic um, statute allows for other information um, to be used from the Postal Service to validate and not reject ballots. The real question here, um, and I'm, I'm a big basketball fan, I know John is too, we've talked about this, these pictures. Um, the real question here is that there will be a narrative in this election because there are in close elections or elections where someone's trying to undermine the confidence that there will be people trying to find more votes. And the question really is, if you are an eligible elector, you've been provided a ballot because you are a qualified voter in this country and you mail it back in, so the shot gets off, you mail it back in on Monday or on Tuesday before the close of the polls, before the buzzer runs out, isn't it the case that we should count that ballot? And we should have policies aligned to allow for that ballot to come in in a couple of days afterwards, as long as we can verify uh, that it was in fact voted in time. And more and more states are moving that way. And also um, there's a lot of litigation around this particular question in the states that are what we call in hand states. So let's talk a little bit about the reporting um, of results and how that changes under vote by mail. In this COVID moment, I think, you know, there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of coverage of what do we do about poll workers? What do we do because they are the vulnerable demographic? What do we do about polling places? There are jurisdictions, I've 
heard as low as 25% of their polling places are denying them and as high as 100% of their facilities have said you can't come back in November. We don't want you. I've also heard that the places that are allowing that, them back in are requiring very costly hazmat cleanings after election day. Um, and so those are the things that we're hearing about and understanding, but there are far more ramifications that are still percolating. This is an example from Orange County, California, where the ballot drop boxes for vote by mail, there's always um, a bipartisan team, you know, two people of two different political parties that go out with social distancing, they can't go in the same car. So they're having to use two cars, one person in each car to go pick up the ballots at each of these places. That slows everything down. Um, so that's one of the total unforeseen um, circumstances. And I think that it's absolutely true what Jonathan says here from the Philadelphia Inquirer is that it's time to get comfortable with the idea that some races are not gonna be called on election night. Um, and here are some of the reasons why. Um, and it's also important, I'll get to the reasons why in a second, um, but it's important to think about the way in which the results are being reported. We used to have precinct-based results and that was the majority when everybody was at the top of that uh, triangle, um, that was the majority of the voting. But now we know that with vote centers and more vote by mail, reporting the percentage of precincts in um, is going to be a little bit challenging in some places because I might have um, one vote by mail ballot from every single one of my precincts and no in person voting from election day. And if I put up those res results, it's going to say I've got results from every precinct. So there are some real challenges in how the, the percentages are reported. Um, I've mentioned Charles Stewart a couple of times. He has, um, along with some others, some really good papers on different ways to contemplate this kind of reporting um, of the results. And it's also important to know that, you know, there's this urban myth, and you probably have heard it, that election, you know, the ballots get, blown, get thrown away if it's not a blowout or um, if it's not a close race or if it is a blowout and it's not a close race, they just throw out the ballots um, anyway um, because they don't make an impact. Well, most ballots have a lot of things on them and there's always something close somewhere. So covering the fact that these are unofficial results, they're unofficial results on election day in every election, whether it's close or not, all of the activities that happen after the election happen every election, whether it's close or not. And it's often said by election officials that you can have your elections fast, cheap, or accurate, but you get to pick two and only two. Um, and in this moment, it's going to be difficult because this is how vote-by-mail ballots are processed in many states. This is Montgomery County. It's two people opening up with a letter opener and taking out that ballot, unfolding it, you know, flattening it out so it can be counted. And in other places, there are extraction machines being used that can do thousands of them an hour. So this is a question of resources and timeliness. And budgets are even tighter now. I know many elections offices are being asked to cut back on their budgets. Um, the Secretary of State of California has been told they will have a 10% reduction of salary of all their employees and they will be furloughing some of the staff. So these are challenging times. And as we saw from that timeline, time is running out to make any of these, um, these changes that can help improve how speedily, how quickly um, we get results. It doesn't mean we don't want it now, because of course we do. But it's really important that if we're going to allow voters this ability to, um, to exercise a franchise in a vote by mail environment, that we allow sufficient time after election day to process it. It's also important to know um, that many states, including Michigan, Pennsylvania, and my state of Maryland, um, they don't allow the election officials to begin processing those ballots until election day. So in the past, when it was a few hundred ballots or a few thousand ballots, that's not as problematic. But when Michigan had 1.4, 1.5, I think uh, Secretary Benson tweeted out the other day that they've already had surpassed those requests. Um, and they're not going to be able to touch those, those packets to even open them or do any sort of verification until election day. It's going to draw things out. The good thing is there's um, another um, report from the Bipartisan Policy Center um, on some recommendations that will help speed these things up um, and things that 
other states have already done and are doing. And so it's, it's nothing revolutionary. These are best practices. Um, and I also like to include this just because um, she does not look happy with the fact that she has to hand um, extract every single one of those envelopes. And behind her is, you know, a wall of trays. Um, it's, they'll be doing this for hours and hours and days and days. So I wanted, oh shoot, I forgot to take out the animation here. Sorry about that, John. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about signature verification. So I pulled a few slides from um, my uh, presentation I gave when I was a local official in Arizona and talk a little bit about how important it is that when we talk about signature verification, that there's sufficient training in a state to make sure that we don't have disproportionately impacted communities. And what I mean by that is oftentimes our government forms have three fields to put your name in. Um, whereas there are many communities of voters where they have multiple names. There's you know four names depending on multiple surnames. It's very um, traditional and Vietnamese cultures and others. So it's important that this kind of training occurs as well as having forensic training on, on uh, kind of an exercise like this, which was called apples to apples, where you have to match up each of the, um, the, the apple with the, the like apple um, to make sure that you're training your eye to look at the certain things like slant, connections, stopping points, line orientation. And this was another, another worksheet that we did. This is the way that you make sure, um, in addition to not having party affiliation and, and other things that could weigh in on the adjudicators, um, you know, motivations in accepting or rejecting a ballot. And it's also important that there's never one person that makes the final determination, that if someone thinks it's questionable, that it goes to someone else to review, um, and that there are multiple layers of authenticating um, who in fact um, has said that something's good or bad. The other piece to this is curing of ballots. And this is something that is often talked about in terms of, um, good customer service. And it, it is good customer service, but it's also a security measure. So what happens when we talk about ballot curing is that um, if, it's miss, if a ballot is missing a signature or the signature is considered a mismatch, that someone reaches out to the voter, either they call them, send them an email, a text message, um, a letter in the mail, whatever it happens to be, to find out if it was them or not. And I will tell you, I've called hundreds of voters over more than a decade. I never once had a voter say, it wasn't me. I had them say, my arm was in a cast. I had just suffered a stroke. Um, I was signing my ballot you know, on the dashboard of the car as I drove. Um, and they were all shocked that we called. And they felt much better about the authentication of and the legitimacy of their ability to, to cast that ballot wisely. The real story here also is two things we want to make sure voters think about when they're voting by mail for the first time. And that is one, put your name in the same way you put it in uniformly, consistently in all um, government interactions. Um, even if you have four or five, however you want to do it, just do it consistently. And the second thing is, this is not the time to fill out or try out a new autograph. Again, consistency and uniformity um, is really, really critical. Um, and in all of these cases, I think there's some real stories here to talk about and to show the work that goes on by members of our community who are poll workers and central poll workers who are processing these ballots after election day, whether it's provisionals or audits um, or the vote by mail ballots. So let's talk just real briefly about two challenges um, for one, a very discreet population of voters that have some challenges um, with vote by mail, and that's in Indian country. So this is um, a, a Google Earth image of the Gakka village in Maricopa County, Arizona, which was one of the um, villages that I worked with when I was in uh, Maricopa. And you'll notice there aren't a lot of streets. Um, in fact, the gravel road runs out a few miles before you get to the village. And addresses in Indian country are one big challenge. And so one of the things that we've done is we have worked with the Postal Service to establish a single point of contact for the tribes for tribal addressing outreach and um, to help establish um, postal uh, formatted um, addresses for voters. I'm also using tribal government buildings as an acceptable address, um, preferably if there's one in each precinct, 
um, if a tribal nation is divided up um, in uh, precincts within the state. This is really modeled after Secretary Wyman and the state of Washington and some of the things that they put into place with their um, Native American Voting Rights um, Act. Another thing, and this is zoomed in a little bit closer into the village, um, has to do with delivery. So the vast majority majority of tribal lands um, don't get delivery to the villages, to the homes, and individuals need to get post off box, PO boxes. Um, and um, tribal ID was not an acceptable ID to use in getting a United States post office box. So we're working on, on getting that changed. We're working on an evaluation of um, the supply of post off boxes around the reservation lands, and then also looking at establishing cluster boxes, much like what you see at an HOA, um, at tribal government buildings for individuals, um, so they don't have to travel somewhere, sometimes you know, close to 100 miles um, to get the mail. Then let's talk lastly um, about the United States Postal Service this year. Um, and we've heard a lot that um, you know, lawmakers are gonna warn that it's going bankrupt. Former Postmaster Brennan, in March of this year said, we do not expect disruption or degradation to the services that we provide. They established a variety of protocols um, and, um, and methods in place to make sure that vote by mail and ballots got priority um, treatment, not priority mail, um, but had um, you know, a, an additional attention paid to them. However, um, on the 14th, so just a couple days ago, there was a memo that was posted um, on the Washington Post um, about the new dep the new Postmaster General, um, and a memo that was sent out basically saying that the timeline of the clock is is now tantamount, and even if there are if there's mail on the the in the equipment, turn it off. Your shift is done. Go home. No more late deliveries. No more waiting for a truck um, to to come in before you know before. Um, processing or before closing down. And this is going to create a lot of issues. It's going to create issues with postmarking because up until this point, the postmarking of mail has always been from the Postal Service that any mail picked up on a given day will be postmarked that day. And that meant that even if it was traveling 200 miles to a processing plant, that plant would stay open and process that mail with that day's postmark, even if it was being postmarked after midnight. Now the question is, is that still going to be the case? Yesterday was tax day. I think it'll be very interesting to find out um, if in fact they adhered to this new protocol or not. So um, lastly, I wanna really super quickly go through some of the resources available and then we can jump in and spend the last uh, half hour or so um, on some questions. One of the things that I would recommend if you're going to be covering the Postal Service and vote by mail a lot is to sign up for industry alerts. You'll probably want it to go into a certain um, envelope <laughs> in your mailbox, certain folder. Um, this is where you find out if there's an outage anywhere. This is where you find out what countries we are now delivering mail back to and receiving mail from. Um, we didn't talk about military and overseas voters, but up until recently, there were more than 100 nations that we were not delivering mail to or receiving mail from. Um, industry alerts tell you all about that. So it's, it's a good thing to get kind of um, information on an ongoing basis. Sometimes you don't get any for a couple of days. Some days you get a lot. Um, also, I recommend um, checking out electionline.org if you're not familiar with them already. They are um, a daily collection of news about election um, administration, so not so much the campaigns, but this is a great place to see what's happening not only in your own state, but um, nationally if you if that's what you cover is national news. The Vote at Home Institute I mentioned and shared, they have a great list of resources of a wide variety of, um, of academic papers and others. The Election Performance Index is um, a site that started at Pew um, years ago and is now housed at the MIT Election uh, Data Science Lab. It contains 17 different indices where you can select different states and rank them according to the number of ballots they rejected, the number of ballots they 
transmitted or mailed out to voters, um, provisional ballots, ballots rejected, unreturned, all sorts of things. Um, and it's just a great way of comparing either states to, to other states, states nationally, one state comparing to itself over time. I would suggest though, 2006, um, data and before, I think they, we even stopped even putting out 2006 because the data completeness was so poor, um, but from 2008 on is, is pretty good. All of the, a lot of the information comes from the Election Assistance Commission and the EVES survey, which now also has an interactive element to it. The EAC has also put out a couple of webinars, both by Postal Service employees as well as secretaries of state and local officials about how they're reacting and how they're scaling up their vote by mail programs. Um, uh, the Brookings Institute just put out a scorecard yesterday. There's some challenges with the, the items that they chose to rank the states on. Um, so there's some things I personally would have changed and I've reached out to them um, to suggest some additional changes. Um, so I take that one a little bit with a grain of salt, but um, there's some good information there. And then the National Conference of State Legislatures, their elections and campaign, and campaign unit um, keeps abreast of what's happening in the state legislatures, what bills are being introduced, um, I mean, it's kind of an easy way to keep track of some of that. And then lastly, uh, I think this is the last one, uh, William & Mary Law School um, has all of the state's election codes for all 50 states and DC in one place. So you don't have to dig around. Um, it's all listed there. And then there's annotated um, information for seven states. And across the top, which you can't see um, so well here, there was also some work that we did on election emergencies um, across the states on who has authority to do various things, whether it's, um, you know, does it fall with the legislature? Does it fall with the governor's office? Um, and so that's kind of a quick resource as well. Um, and I did have one more. And this is the Native American Rights Fund. NARF just published this voluminous um, report on some of the challenges and obstacles in Indian country based on some of their um, commission on civil rights. Oh, I forgot about the academic stuff. So here's the one on signature verification. Um, if you're interested in, in that, here's one on partisan turnout. And then lastly, I think, I keep saying lastly, um, Charles on some of the demographics of voting by mail. Yes, that was it. Um, so this is my contact information. I am available um, at any time. And I usually don't leave the wrong footer on everything um, that I did on the last slide. So we'll get that corrected before it gets posted. Um, and this is Orange County, Florida. I'm When I finally retire someday, when I'm 900 years old, I'm going to do a PVC um, use in elections. This is something that Orange County did to take care of their television cabling. So when the television crews and radio crews came in, it was a problem because all the cables were running through their office. So they put this big PVC pipe in the middle of the wall that goes out to, um, to the parking lot. And I just love to show and demonstrate how clever election officials can be um, and how often they are required to do so. So with that, I am going to stop my screen share and um, and we can open it up for questions.